So why should you even do boring things, right? Like, especially when it comes to SAT prep, why boring things? Why boring things in particular? Well, the reason is because most people don't want to do the boring things. And if you do what most people do, which is not doing the boring things, you're going to get the results that most people get, which is not very good. And this is, in essence, it's not knocking being average. We're all going to be average in some departments, and especially when it comes to standardized tests. What I'm saying is that everyone has a potential they can fulfill, right? Like based on your upbringing and your academic knowledge, you can score a certain amount on the SAT and even push yourself beyond those limits, especially when you do the boring things, okay? You don't want to end up like, let me just draw some guy. Let's just say this is Bob, right? This is Bob is cool, right? But Bob is lazy and he takes AP Calculus BC in his high school but he is lazy. And so what he's end up getting is a 1000 SAT. Like you cannot be an AP Calc BC and getting 1000 on your SAT, right? That's just, what are you even doing at this point, right? He's not going to fulfill his potential. So don't be like this guy. All right. So what is this boring thing? Well, it's just keeping track of your mistakes. I'm not, I'm not going to sugarcoat it with like some sexy secret strategy. It's really just keep track of your mistakes, right? And if you click off this video, I think that just proves a point. You don't want to do the boring thing. The boring thing is knowing where you are making mistakes, right? It's just like if you get a test or a paperback, you look at your mistakes because that's where you had your pitfalls, right? If you take the time to review it, the problem type, what you actually answered, why you got it wrong. This is so important. Like what was your thought process? Why did you initially think that was right? Were you just completely didn't know the topic and you just guess, right? Like that's something to keep track of because then you have metrics that you can go back on. And what did you learn from it? So how are you going to apply what you learned from that problem that you made a mistake on that? How are you going to grow from that? Right. And if you approach future problems, then you, how are you going to solve it and make sure you don't make those same mistakes on test day. Okay. And it's being really diligent on the actual test on SAT day as well to not make these same mistakes. And so for the rest of this video, I actually have two practice problems. I want you guys to solve those problems. I know that it's not as cool as 10 minutes of SAT strategy and prep, but that's the boring thing, right? I'm just promoting it right now. The boring thing. The boring thing is doing practice problems as well, right? Do those practice problems. If you get them right, awesome. If you get them wrong, keep track of your mistakes. Where did you go wrong, okay? So you can load up the problems right now and best of luck on your SAT prep. And I'll see you guys in another video. V quadratic function A times X plus 4.5 squared minus D can be rewritten as X minus 9.5 times X plus C if a is equal to one, what is the value of D? So this is one of those problems that might look kind of weird, but at its core, it's literally just a quadratic function problem. And if you work through it and take the time, anyone can solve this problem. Okay. So the first thing we see is that we have two, basically two quadratic functions, but they are apparently equal to each other. It's just that one of the variables or two of the variables here, as you can see, D and C are unknown. Okay, and so we can't just set these two expressions equal because we have two unknown variables. They also say that in this case, a is just equal to one, which makes this very easy because then we can just say a is negligible, right? It's not going to impact the rest of our expression. So now we're left with x plus 4.5 squared minus d, and then this uh, factored out expression of x minus 9.5 times x plus c. So in order to solve this problem, what we need to do is first get them in the same form. Right, because we know these are both quadratic functions. If we get them in the same form, we can make that accurate one-to-one -one comparison. So let's expand this out. X plus 4.5 squared. That's the same thing as X squared plus 9X plus, and then 4.5 squared is 20.25. So this is 20.25. And then that's not all because we still have this minus D at the end. We know minus D here, D is just presumably some value is going to be a, doesn't have to be an integer, but it is a value. And so this will be tacked on to the end of our C value in this quadratic function. So this will be minus D. Boom. Okay, awesome. So we have this expressed out. What do we need to do now? Now let's do the same thing to the other part of the quadratic expression. That means X minus 9.5 times X plus C. So this will be X squared. I should probably write this in another color. So this will be x squared, and then we have plus. The reason I'm writing plus here, even though we have probably 
uh, negative 9.5 and C as our X terms is that I want to be able to make a one-to-one -one comparison, right? So if I have plus here, because I had plus uh, in the other expression as well. And so this will end up being, we're gonna have C minus 9.5. And this entire thing is our X term. And then let's do the same thing again with the plus, regardless of what the actual value is, because we just put this all in parentheses. Then we have negative 9.5 times C. And so we just have negative 9.5 times C at the end as our C value, which is kind of confusing because the missing variable is actually C. Okay, so we have these two expressions now. What do we do? Well, one of the things that we can actually do here is compare between these two expressions. Can we compare this term, right? Because we're trying to solve for C, so it'd be very nice if we could just one-on-one -on -one compare these two terms. But no, again, we have the same problem. These two have different variables. We have D and C. We can't just magically come up with that number. But in the B value of both of these quadratic functions, you can see 9x and C minus 9.5x. Well, guess what? We can set these two equal to each other because the rest of the expression, right, is equivalent, right? We have x squared plus yada yada yada, x squared plus yada yada yada. And so this makes things very easy. 9 is our B value. And then we have C minus 9.5 in the other function. And now we can solve for C. And so C here would be 18.5. So now that we know the C value, this makes the problem super easy because we see we have this C value in here. So what we can do is 18.5 times negative 9.5, which will give us negative 175.75. And so now when we go ahead and set this part of our quadratic expression equal to this part of the quadratic expression, we only have one missing term, that being D, which we can pretty easily solve for. So if we set 100, negative 175.75 equal to 20.25 minus D, and now we can just solve for D. In this case, D would be equivalent to 196, and that is the answer to this problem. Here's our next problem again dealing with a quadratic function it says for the given function f of x where a and b are integer constants f of negative 21 is positive f of negative 15 is positive and f of negative 18 is negative one is what is one possible value of a plus b now many of you would probably use the desmos regression function to solve this but i think if you do this by hand you understand fundamentally what it is asking you it is actually much faster to do it by hand so if we just think about it, if we have, let's just say we draw this um, little visual here, negative 21 is a positive value. So I don't know, I'm just gonna mark it out here somewhere. Negative 15 is a positive value. I'm gonna mark it out here somewhere. And the reason I made these two, I guess, equal to each other in terms of their y value is because they are also uh, three units away from f of negative 18, which we called negative, right? I don't know for sure, but I'm just saying that it is possible, it is mathematically possible for that to occur. And so f of negative 18 is negative. So in this case for a quadratic, because we know the parabola is symmetrical, that could theoretically be our vertex value, okay? So that f of negative 18. So f of negative 18 will just be in the middle, and then it's gonna be a negative value, so it's gonna be under that x-axis. And well, now we just have a parabola, right? So let's just connect this. It's not that this is really important, but, uh, this is a horrible parabola, but just imagine that it was a good looking parabola. It's asking what is one possible value of a plus b. So here's what's interesting now is we see that f of negative 21 and f of negative 15 are positive values. And what are we trying to find here? We're trying to find the value of a plus b, right? And so it would be very, very helpful if we were able to find the value of x. Like what do we plug in for x, right? What is a possible value for x for this function? Well, for a quadratic expression, we have roots, right? So we have this root right here. So I'm gonna circle this in blue. This is a root and this is a root. These roots are the solutions to this expression, right? So if you plug uh, each of these roots in for X, you should get zero, right? Because you're basically solving for the equation. That's where it hits that X axis. And so here we don't know the exact X value, but we can presume, right? It is asking for a possible value of A plus B. 
And so here, what is a possible value for the root, the x value, where it hits 0? We know this right here is f of negative 21. So the x value there for that point is negative 21. We know the vertex is f of negative 18. And so this root right here just has to be something in between. And the same goes for this root over here. The only thing you have to be careful of is you can't pick just any value, but the value you pick has to be equal distant in terms of the other side. So this is what I mean. So if I were to pick a random number between negative 18 and negative 21, let's just say negative 19. So I pick negative 19 here as my x value. Let's just say that's the root. Well, for the other side, because negative 19 is one unit away from negative 18, the parabola is symmetrical. And so this also has to be one unit away. One unit away of from negative 18 and the positive direction here will just be negative 17. So boom, now I have my x values or my solutions, but that's not a plus b. So if we plug it back in, we have x plus a times x plus b. And so we can rewrite this with the roots. It would be negative uh, 19 plus a multiplied by x plus, oops, not x, negative 17 because that was our other root plus b. And then we can set this equal to zero for each of our uh, solutions. And so this part right here, a will be equal to 19 and b will be equal to 17. And so 19 plus 17 is equal to 36. And so that is one possible value of a plus b, but there's obviously other possible values. I could pick negative 20 and uh, negative 16, et cetera.